Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's clap our hands. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, you can stand up on your feet and clap your hands. Come on, praise the name of the Lord. He woke us up this morning. Hallelujah. Are you excited to get up and come into the house of the Lord? I don't know about you, but the Lord has been good to me. He's been good to me all week. He's allowed me to get up. He's allowed me to work. He's allowed me to see my family. He's allowed me to get up this Sunday morning and come into the house of the Lord. Are you excited about it? Come on, you can clap your hands. Let's charge the atmosphere. I'm pretty sure the Lord has been good to you. Has he been good to you? Hallelujah. Those of you who are chiming in, we bring you greetings at the Cathedral Grace Family Church, where my bishop is Robert Fulton Hargrove II and my first lady, Sheila C. Hargrove, where the vision is building God's kingdom, one family at a time, through evangelism, education, and empowerment. Hallelujah. Those of you who are still chiming in, we appreciate you, for you could have praised and worship and chose anywhere, but you chose to tap in to the cathedral. Grace Family Church, we have about five minutes, about five minutes before the man of God comes up. We have about five minutes before the man of God comes up. Come on, where's your attitude at this morning? I have a praise in my spirit this morning that I'm going to lift up the name of the Lord. No matter what's going on, I'm going to praise his name. No matter what the finances is looking like, I'm going to praise his name. No matter what the job is talking like, I'm going to praise his name. No matter what's going on on TV, I'm going to praise his name. No matter what's scrolling on Facebook, I'm going to praise his name. No matter what the situation is, I'm going to praise his name because I know that in Jesus, I have the victory. I know that in Jesus, I'm going to win. No matter what, I'm going to win. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches us that no weapon, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Those weapons may fall, but they are not. I'm telling you, they are not going to prosper. The Bible teaches us that let the redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And I'm going to lift up the name of the Lord. Come on, why don't you clap your hands with me? I'm going to clap my hands with you, and we're going to praise. We're going to magnify. We're going to lift up. We're going to magnitude. Oh, clap unto the Lord. Oh, ye people. Hallelujah. Somebody said, who is the king of glory? I said, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Has he been strong in your life? Has he been lifting you up? Has he been keeping you in peace? I'm glad about it. I'm glad about it. I'm glad about it. If you want a blessing, are you looking for a blessing this morning? I'm looking for a blessing this morning. I'm looking for a word this morning. I'm looking for a word from the Lord. We have about three minutes, three minutes before the men of God comes up. We have about three minutes before the men of God comes up. I see you in the back clapping your hands. I'm excited about it. This side, I see you clapping your hands. The Lord woke you up and he lifted us this morning. He's been good to me all week, all week. No matter what the enemy come to do, he has lost the battle. Hallelujah. We have already won the battle because of Jesus and what he did. Hallelujah. He died so that we can come into the house and praise the name of the Lord. Before where is the Lord? There is liberty. Hallelujah. We have about two minutes. Two minutes before the man of God comes up about two minutes before the man of God comes up. Those of you who are tapping in, I would like to acknowledge some of you for tapping in. Michael Dawson, thank you so very much for choosing the cathedral 
Grace Family Church, Philip Braxton. We appreciate you, Linda Robinson. We appreciate you for chiming in. Andrew D. Coley, we appreciate you and thank you. Pastor Pamela Williams, bless you. We thank you so very much. All the way from the Bronx, New York, Rebecca Lewis, we thank you so very much for tapping into this live broadcast. Helen Monaco, thank you so very much for tapping in. John Newsom, Teresa Barlow, Patsy Heath, we thank you so very much for timing in to this live broadcast. Once again, my name is Minister Sherwood, and we are here in the great city of Atlantic City, 3901 at the Cathedral Grace Family Church, where my bishop is Robert Fulton Hargrove II, and my first lady, Sheila C. Hargrove, where the vision is still building God's kingdom, one family at a time, through evangelism, education, and empowerment. We have about one minute, one minute before the man of God comes up. Come on, are you excited? Are you excited? Because the word is about to come forth. Come on, clap your hands and stand up on your feet. For the man of God is getting ready to come up. He's been gone for about two weeks. He is back into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Introducing our bishop. He is the preacher of the first magnitude. Bishop is not a novice. He has been pastoring for over 32 years. Bishop is educated. He received his terminal degree from North Carolina Theological Seminary. Our bishop is very active civically and socially in our community. He serves on many boards. He currently serves as the president of the Fellowship of Churches of Atlantic City and vicinity. He also serves on the board of Interfaith Action Movement. The Bible teaches us that faith without works is dead. Introducing our bishop, he not only has the faith, he not only has the work, this man of God, this powerful, prolific, God sent man of God, introducing Reverend Dr. R. Fulton Hargrove the second. morning. God bless you. Grace and peace be unto you. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad about it. I said this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad about it. Everybody on your row. Look at the person next to you and say, warning, you're sitting next to a praiser. I might knock your hat off, I might bump your wig, I might kick you in the ankle. I'm just giving you a warning because God has been so good to me that if I jump up out my seat and start waving my hand, I'm not crazy, I'm not high, I'm not confused, I'm just thankful that the Lord has opened another door. I'm thankful that the Lord has closed another door. Is anybody thankful this morning? God bless you. Good morning, Facebook family. Good morning, YouTube family. Good morning to those of you that are on the phone line. We welcome you to the Cathedral Grace Family Church, where our vision is building God's kingdom, one family at a time, in the great city of Atlantic City, 3901 Gilbert Avenue. Thank you for chiming in today. You are not here by accident. You are not here by chance. This is the day the Lord has made. This first Sunday in May, the Lord made this day. Can I get a witness? 
yeah, yeah. You got 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. Woo! Yes, Lord. All oh, praise Him. Praise Him. I don't know about you, but I had a flashback on just how good God's been to me. Somebody shout, devil, you should have killed me when you had a chance. Facebook family, you might as well get up off that sofa, get up out that bed, get up from the kitchen table. This is the day the Lord has made. Come on, help me praise Him. Praise Him in your socks, praise Him in your stockings, praise Him with your barefoot, praise Him with your slippers, praise Him in your pajamas, praise Him in your bathroom. He is great. And greatly to be praised. Watch out, devil. Somebody shout, watch out, devil. I said, somebody shout, watch out, devil. Put it in the chat. Watch out, devil.
Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Glory to your holy name, Lord Jesus. Glory to your holy name, Lord Jesus. Glory to your holy name. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise the Lord. Grace and peace be unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Thank you, Minister Sherwood. As always, such a profound presentation to our elders, our deacons, our ministers, all of our officers, our leadership team, to our youth pastor who covered the pulpit in my absence, to our illustrious first lady, to these, amen, 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 to our skillful musicians, skillful. Jesus, Pastor Sherwood took two fish, five loaves, fed 5,000 men plus women and children. We got two musicians with two hands, but sound like an orchestra. That's that skill. Not making noise, skill. Skill. So we're grateful for them and we appreciate them. And we appreciate all of you that have joined in our social media. Thank you for joining in with us again. And for our membership and our Facebook family and YouTube family, officially we're going to open the first Sunday in June. And we invite you to come to our high holy service. We invite you to come to our high. We'll officially be coming back into the building. Amen. It's our family and friends day. Amen. And we invite all of our members to come. And our social media family, if you like to, we welcome you. Our culinary team will be in full force. So after worship outside, we're going to have, as they were saying, south, some vittles. Some vittles. Amen? Sure. Some vittles. Yeah. Not peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> but some vittles. Amen? Glory to God. We're so grateful for our senior male in the church, Pop Bobby Wright. Put your hands together for him. <laughs> Hold on, brother. Hold on. Amen. To our church mother, Mother Slade. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Amen. We appreciate all of you and thank the Lord for you and to our new members that have joined even as we kind of exit this pandemic, but we thank the Lord for those who are in new membership class and we're excited about getting to know you a little better and moving forward. Amen? Amen. Well, it's time for the word of the Lord. Amen. For man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
I'm going to introduce to some and present to others. No, I'm joking. <laughs> A couple of preachers looked over <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> Amen. I want you to join me on this first Sunday in May to the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. The gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. We're going to begin reading at verse 20. Matthew 26, the gospel of St. Matthew 23. Matanahi, Matthias, Levi. Yeah, Levi. He was a Jew that uh, was collecting taxes from Jews. He was exercising Roman behavior as a Jew. They didn't like him. The traitor. But Jesus said, you're one. Come on. You're one. Anybody been rejected by man? But not by God? Come on in. I got room for you. Come on in. Amen. Amen. If you have it, say praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something with me today. We normally don't do it, but I'm going to ask you uh, if you would stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you so kindly. Thank you. Amen. And please follow along as I read. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Shout twelve. Now, as they were eating, as they were eating, meaning all 12, fix that thing. Or shortly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped, listen to that, not dipping, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Amen? Amen. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man if he had not been born. And whatever you're going to do, do it because it ain't changing nothing here. Right. Amen. Amen? Somebody say, I'm going to finish my assignment. I'm finish my assignment. <laughs> then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? I, 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 I ought to flip over to the Good News translation because it's a little closer. Uh, or NIV is a little closer. You know what he really said in the original translation? Uh, uh, Rabbi, are you talking to me? Go back and read it. And, and, and the strictest translation is not, you know what I mean, uh, Rabbi, is it I? Judas responded, Lord, are you talking to me? And now you understand why he says, thou sayest. Amen? You have said it. He said, are you talking to me? You said it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And as they were eating, shout they. The twelve. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Amen? Amen. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Listen at this. Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the word of the Lord. Before you take your seat, and I know you said, I hope you don't ask me to stand no more when you read eight verses. Before you take your seat, I want you to shout to the devil, Devil! I am forgiven. Yeah. 
I am forgiven. I'm going to try. Father, we love you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. We thank you that our steps are ordained and have been ordained before the foundation of the world. Thank you that you know the end from the beginning. That's why our steps are ordained. Because when you see us about to fall, you order our steps so we don't. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity and privilege to assemble ourselves together, to join by social media, by streams of Facebook, YouTube, telephone. Thank you, Lord. We hungry. We're thirsty. And the word says we shall be filled. Bless us today that our eyes may see, our ears may hear, and our hearts may feel. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's people say, Amen. Come on and put your hands together as you take your seat. If you believe you've been forgiven, put your hands together as you take your seat. As a call man of God, uh, as your pastor trying to serve you with the best of my ability, I think every now and then you should know something about my background. I was not aspiring to be anything else. I was not running from ministry. I was fighting to stay on the deacon board when God called me to preach. Because I served as a junior deacon. Because in the 60s and 70s, when you came up in the sanctified church, it meant something to be a deacon. It, it meant something. And they trained us. Sister Pat will tell you, we didn't have youth church. We didn't have children's church. You came in with your parents, and you sat there, and your mama had a strap in the pocketbook. Now, you can make noise if you want. But somebody was going to get your attention, and it wasn't an usher. I came up in the United Pentecostal Church. Glorious United Pentecostal Church of God. It had long names back then. The Glorious United Pentecostal Church of God. Bishop Edward E. Blaine Sr., founder and general overseer, incredible man of God. In 1975, he had a Ph.D. Bad, 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 smart man. And this organization had churches, you know, it was a denomination everywhere, and I happened to be here in Atlantic City. Our church service was nothing like church today. Number one, there's no altar. There is no table with two chairs on the side of it. Because we didn't have praise team. We had deacons that led devotional. Am I right, Sister Dansby? And... They would sing. You would almost think coming up in that church that you had to be able to sing to be a deacon. Be, because, <laughs> well, we're not going to have the deacons lead no <laughs> song service here. <laughs> but but, but, but uh, they would come up 
and, and, and they, they, would, they would each one stand in front of that chair beside that table and, 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 and lead us in, 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 in worship. You know, remember me, Lord. But it was a, a, a long meter hymn. You, you know, I know, I know you got to be over 50 to know what I'm talking about. It was a long me to him. They wasn't no clapping and stomp hands and stomping feet, and you know, like we get down the day. It was more like, remember me. That's how the deacon sounds. <laughs> And they would carry us through that, and, 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 and then we just had a lot of things, amen, about that church that we don't have today. A, a, another thing is, church said we started at 11, we started about 11.25. It had no clock in the church, like y'all be turning around looking. Had no clock to witness to you, you get out when we get done. There was no hour of power in the 60s in the church. But no hour of power. And Sunday was not Sunday. Tell me if I'm wrong, Elder Tony. It was the Lord's Day. And they meant that literally because we went to church at 10 o'clock for Sunday school. We got a little cookies and juice. 11 o'clock we had morning worship. After that, we went downstairs and ate, came back upstairs and had afternoon service. After afternoon service, we had YPWW, Young People Willing Workers. After that, we had night service. And after that, you went home and you didn't get up late for school. This is a United Pentecostal church. Amen. We had seating in the church that was assigned. Amen. There were some seats. Amen. If you're in the pulpit on the right hand side, it was a bench sitting there. Amen. That was for the deacons. Nobody else sat over there, not even by accident. Amen. Then there was another one on the left hand side. That was for the mothers. All the women that had reached 75. Amen. And was distinguished. Amen. You know what um, thick white dresses that no stain could get on them. I ain't talking about these stockings. <laughs> but it was a distinguished group of, of women there, and it was just a different kind of church today, but this is what I came up in. Amen. I, this one, let you know, I came up in. Amen. And you have to understand that the service, amen, went according to the pastor. Amen. You know, the pastor would always tell you, the Lord is in charge. Amen. And when it was time for the announcements, it's funny that the secretary always knew every Sunday she was going to read the announcement, but she said, way in the back. And Lonnie, tell me if I'm wrong, when she came up, she opened that bulletin, she read everything from the first the to amen. But it was significant because during that time, some of us were not privileged to be able to read or write. And rather to embarrass them and have them try to figure out what's being said on the bulletin, it was read for everybody to hear. Amen? And so that was some of the upbringing, amen, in the Pentecostal church, amen? Another thing in my background was you never got up and just walked out to church. But you signified, I'm getting up and I'm going out. Now, I don't know if the one meant one minute or one time. But have you ever noticed you never saw this or this? Just one. Just one. Amen? Excuse me. And everybody just let you go about your business. Amen? But when they went out, Sister Pat, they might have been second on the, sitting on the second row. They get going out. When they came back, they didn't dare while the preacher was up walk back down the aisle 
to the second row, Deacon Barnett. I know you came up in Harlem in a Catholic church, but we're going to tell you about the Pentecostal church today. No, 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 no. They start walking back, and you know, tell me when I'm wrong, there was a rope across the aisle. You wasn't coming back through here. Have a, have a seat right here. My pocketbook, it'll be there after church. you to be there after church. Sit down. It was different from today. Amen? There was Pastor Sherwood, first Sunday. Communion Sunday. We didn't wear black and white, Ramir. Everybody wore all white. This was a monumental day. That table that sat there in the front with them two chairs on it, when you saw them on first Sunday, all white. Chairs draped in white. Altar, that red drape on it all came down and the white one went up. And you didn't put your pocketbook on this table. No, 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 no. They had you thinking you was going to hell if you touched that table. Anybody over 50 in here? You, you didn't touch that table. No, 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 no. You didn't, you didn't touch that table. They, they came in on Saturday with them pressed linen and lined that white table up, and everything looked different. And the pastor would preach. Minister Sherwood on Sunday morning. And after the preaching, we would participate. Listen to me now. We call it <laughs> communion, but uh, I'll get to that later. But they, they say, you know, it's the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. And so after the pastor preached, I'm telling you the truth, they would say, now... All of our guests can leave. Because we're about to take the Lord's Supper. All of our guests can leave. I'm just talking about the, the Pentecostal church. The guests, you can leave now. This, But I'm going back, you know what I mean? Now, we ain't talking about the 90s or the 80s or 1979. We're going all the way back to 1967, 68, 69, 70, 71. They tell the guests, you can leave. And when they left, then we could do our communion service. It was called closed communion. It wasn't open to you if you wasn't in the kingdom. It wasn't open to you. But times have changed. Amen? They've changed. But one of the profound things about my upbringing was they made it clear to us that there were two ordinances that Pentecostals obeyed. Amen? The reason they didn't call it communion is because communion has a uh, slant from Catholicism where there's seven sacraments plus these two. They said, well, we don't do all nine of them, so we, we, we observe two ordinances. And number one was baptism. So we're not Catholic. We don't sprinkle, not in the sanctified church. You going down. You going down under the water. Not till your face break the water. You going down. They didn't baptize us in pools. They said because now you got somebody else's sin. They said Jesus got baptized in a river because every three days a river cleanses itself. So they wouldn't baptize you in a pool. And they were said that everybody that got baptized in a pool needed to be baptized again. We got baptized in a lake in Woodbury. Once a year, all the churches in the organization, everybody would meet in Woodbury. Bishop Blaine has so much authority the city would shut the lake and the park down for us. They would bring out the Hammond, the drums, the guitars, stages, set it up. And we had church outside at the lake. And all the candidates, Sister Kim, had white on. All of them. I had white silk socks, white plastic shoes. 
If you're from Atlantic City, it used to be Illinois. It's Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard now, but Illinois and Atlantic, the store is called Lieberman's. I have my white suit with a vest from Lieberman's. You got to uh, put them sheets on you and wrap you up, and we was all lined up to get, take me to the water. Take me to the water. Woo! Ah! Take me to the water. Oh, there were good days. I got baptized. Lord, and then that, listen, and after that, then we would go to the closest church to the lake, Glassboro, United Pentecostal Church. All the candidates would have on white and sit on the side, have this great service, and get a certificate. And in the message, they would tell us, Baptism does not save you. Jesus wants you to be baptized, but it doesn't save you. But there's something attached to it. It's called lifestyle. After you go down, like Jesus went down and you come up, as he came up, it doesn't save you. But there is something attached to you after you are baptized, and it's called lifestyle. Shout, you got to live this thing. One thing they did in the Pentecostal church, if they didn't do anything right, they made you live right. Because we had testimony service. They wanted you to testify to what you did wrong. Because, you know, we had that mourner's bench where you would sit at while they prayed for you. Sister Sandy, to get yourself together. Not only did we have the ordinance of baptism, when you got baptized, you went down in the water and felt good about it. Amen? But we also, listen to me carefully, observed the Lord's Supper. That's what they called it. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Because they wanted it to be distinguished that we're no part of Catholicism. They wanted it to be distinguished. We, so they say, we're not going to say communion. We call it, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And they call Sunday the Lord's Day. Amen? And they were very clear, amen, that uh, when you partook of the Lord's table, amen, because it was definitely called the Lord's table, amen. When you partook of the Lord's table, amen, they were very clear, amen, that you had to be uh, almost of a certain pedigree to partake of the Lord's table. They imply that eating from the Lord's table could save you. They didn't say that, but if you were on the outside looking in, it implied to get in that line. And, and, and get that bread and, and, and that cup, amen. And, and now, we, you know, this wasn't no cornbread. This was a little piece of white something that when you put it in your mouth, it felt like glue. Did the, could we drink? No. But, but, but it was implied that you, 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 you know, this was going to save you, but, but my brothers and sisters, Eating from this table does not save you. Amen? It, it, it doesn't save you. Amen? It, it doesn't save you. Eating from this table does not guarantee, amen, that you're going to heaven. And not eating from this table does not guarantee that you're going to hell. Because there are people that are eating from the Lord's table that are going to hell. And somebody on their way to hell is going to make it to heaven. Because God allows U-turns. Shout, I turn one day. Uh, I turn one day. Amen? And so these were, were some of the things, you know what I mean, that were, uh, you know, encompassed with coming up in a Pentecostal church. But Jesus 
gives us many dynamics of the Lord's Supper. Amen? And for the few moments I have left, we're going to examine a couple. Firstly, it needs to be clear, Pop Right, that when Jesus, amen, assembled himself together with the 12 in the upper room, gave two messages. The first message he gave was, listen, let me let you know something. What I came to do, I'm going to do. And this bread represents my body, broken for you and for many. And this cup represents my blood. It's for the remission of your sins. That was a message to the 12. Amen? But before that message, as we read, he said, one of you that have dipped with me in the cup is going to betray me. Imagine hearing those words. Because in our mind, and from what we've seen in movie portrayal, is that Jesus and Judas was dipping at the same time, but the Bible says, one of you that have dipped. And remember now, if you've been to Carmine's in Tropicana, the Italian restaurant, that's how the, the table was, amen, because the Passover meal, amen, the Lord's Supper came out of the Passover meal. So they ate family style. Everybody ate, Brother Bennett, out of the same dish. So they had all had already dipped out of it, Sister Cynthia. And so now he says, one of you that have dipped are going to betray me. Now you know why everybody said, Lord, is it I? Because they already had dipped. Are you listening to me? Now these are hand-picked disciples of the Lord Jesus. But everybody, when they heard one of you is going to betray me, felt like there's something in my life that could be considered betrayal. Y'all keep looking straight. Nobody will know what you're thinking right now. Just keep looking straight. And so, so, so in these messages, uh, we have an advantage that they did not have. Amen? We have an advantage. When we read today about the Lord's Supper, we have an advantage because we have something that we're privy to a literary style called dramatic irony. Amen? Say dramatic, dramatic. irony. irony. We, we have the privilege of the literary style of dramatic irony, and that is when information that we have that the characters don't have. Dramatic irony is when you are reading something and you get information that the characters you're reading about do not have. Are you listening to me? So when we read, amen, we already know that Judas is going to betray Jesus, but none of them knew that. Are you listening to me? And so in reading, amen, we understand Judas is the betrayer, amen? Amen? We read that, amen? But everybody around the table doesn't know that, amen? Amen? And then Jesus knows that Judas is the betrayer. Amen? And still, he's invited to the table. Somebody say, shake it off. Shake it off. Come on, Facebook family. Shake it off. Jesus knows he is going to betray him, and he's still invited to the table. Now, let's, let's go to Sunday school for a moment. Biblical sitting, or biblically sitting at the table is, uh, in, is a occasion that represents mutual fellowship. Biblically, 
and that culture sitting at the table, I invite you to my table, is a mutual friendship. It's where we uh, do business. It's where we discuss and work things out. Even if we have differences, the way we're going to work out our differences, we are going to come to the table. Amen? Why do you think so many things done today are done at the table? They have business meetings with food at the table. Amen. Because it, that, that's what it was. It was, it was uh, and, and the idea was if you're at the table with me, listen to the language, there's mutual fellowship. There's mutual friendship. Mutual mean equal. We, we got something in common. Are, are, are you with me? The, and the Bible says we don't eat with fornicators. Be, because the writer understood that if you sit at the table with someone, you basically are in agreement, in alignment, in harmony in what that person's with. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that the Pharisees always called Jesus to the carpet because of who he sat at the table with? What did they say? This, this man ain't right. He eateth with sinners. He, he must be a sinner too because they at the table with him, Deacon Dato. This man ain't right. He eateth with prostitutes. This man ain't right. He eats with thieves. This man ain't right. He was at the table with a woman and an alabaster box. Are, are you listening to me? He, he, he got in trouble. All the time with the Pharisees for who he was at the table with. Because the understanding was whoever you're at the table with is mutual. Amen? It's mutual. And if he knew Judas was going to betray him and still invited him to the table, what is the relationship Jesus had with him? I'm glad you asked. The same one that he had with Peter. The same one he had with Andrew. Are you listening to me? The same one he had with Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and John. Amen? In other words, he was still a disciple. And so he comes in, Lottie. He comes in and they're at the table. And after they have the Passover meal, when he takes the bread and bless it and he breaks it. Amen? Listen to what Jesus does. He announces the betrayal, but not the betrayer. Judas, I know who you are. Judas, I know what you're about. Judas, I know you're going to let me down. Judas, I know you're going to drop the ball. Judas, I know you're going to backslide. Judas, I know you're going to sell me out. But come to the table. Come to the table. You invited to the table. And I'm not going to out you. And my brothers and sisters, somebody shout good news. Because what the Lord is really saying. Is there some things I know about you that there's no dramatic irony nobody else knows and I'm not going to tell them. Put your hands together and say thank you Jesus. He says there's some things under your suit. There's some things under your dress. There's some things in your heart. There's some things in your past. There's some things in your mind that I know about that if anybody else knew about, oh, you would be damned. But I'm going to tell you something. I might convict you about it, but I ain't going to let nobody else know. Isn't God amazing? If you don't thank God for nothing else, if you don't praise God for nothing else, you ought to thank him and praise him that the you at home nobody knows about. I know I'm preaching now because who you are home, that person can't show up here. Oh no. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do no adjectives because nobody's saying nothing. But I do know some of the actions 
and idiosyncrasies that we have at home. We wouldn't dare show up at the Lord's house like that. Oh no. We would never speak to my spouse in God's house like that. But God have mercy on you when you get in that car. Some of the best church arguments are on the way to church and on the way home from church. We get it in on the way to church. And we get it in on the way home. Are you with me? We're going to hold that thing. But when we get out that sanctified building and get inside them cars. Now, what was that last night you was trying to say to me? You know how we do. Look, look, look. This is how the man do it. This is how the man do it, Pastor. Uh, uh. Uh, 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 honey, uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about something. But don't you bring up yesterday. You better not bring that up because I was going to let it slide. But now since you done said that, let me tell you something. He driving the car. <laughs> let, let me, I only got a couple of minutes left. Let, let me go on. Let me go. I only got a couple of minutes left. <laughs> let me, let me, He said, well, well, we, we just, just, that's okay. We're going to finish talking about this over dinner. Dinner? You, you, better, you better go through a drive through because I ain't cooking nothing. That, that ain't right. That ain't right. You talking about right? You want me to bring up right? Don't you? You want more? Sisters, don't forget nothing. Year, day, date, and time. And then ask you, you don't remember? And then he say, no. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. 11 years ago, you got to remember. Three days before my birthday, you did such and such. He's about, huh? <laughs> and then he started talking about, I don't remember. I really don't remember. And the sad part is, he don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> he really don't remember. Let me, I only got a couple more minutes. And so, and so he announces the betrayal, but not the betrayal. If we love and appreciate anything about God, it should be because of what he knows about us that he will not expose us. Amen? Amen? amen. amen. And so at the table, amen, he, he also, amen, just sets the tone for the other disciples. Because, listen to me now, this is on Thursday. Are you with me? On Friday, say Good Friday. Good Friday. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Before he goes to Golgotha, he goes to Gethsemane. Amen? At Gethsemane, Judas kisses him on the cheek. So they know who he is. The gangster, I mean Peter, pulls out a switchblade and cuts a guy. Are you listening to me? What day is it? Say Good Friday. Well, on Thursday at night, Peter had his blade and did not cut Judas. Jesus set the tone because betrayal is sin. You betray me, you sin. And he set the tone. I hope you're ready for this. I hope you're ready for this. He set the tone, Sister Nadine, that sinners can't judge sinners. 
Have you ever read Matthew 7 and 1? Judge not and be ye not judged. Sinners cannot judge sinners. The only thing you can do is love a sin, but you can't judge. He said, Peter, he might have stuck his hand in his pocket. But because he said, who have dipped with me. Oh, take my hand out my pocket. Take my hand out my pocket. Sinners can't judge sinners. Now, because that doesn't say it in those words in the Bible, we judge. That's all we do is judge. We're the most judgmental people in the world. Not this church, the church. The ecclesia, the called out body of Christ. We're the most judgmental people in the world. Shame on us. The church, Sister Pat, used to meet people where they were. We walk into a restaurant. Somebody standing outside the door because they're hungry. We didn't look at them like shame over here begging. We say, excuse me, are you hungry? Yeah. Would you like something? Yes. Come on in. I'll buy it. But today we judgmental. Hanging around out here. We see somebody thumbing for a ride. You don't want to pick them up, don't pick them up, but don't judge them. Why are they out here asking for a ride? Ain't getting in here raping me. Ain't going to get in here and stick me up. Be careful how you treat strangers. Because it may be an angel unaware. Okay, all right. So, 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 so sinners don't judge sinners. Amen? After he announces the betrayal, but not the betrayer, Sister Coffin, he administers the Lord's Supper, and the Bible says, to his disciples. He administers the Lord's Supper to his disciples. He administers the Lord's Supper to his disciples. Are you listening to me? His disciples. James, John, Peter, Andrew, Bartholomew, Matthew, who was called Levi, Thomas, amen, Simon, amen, the zealot, Judas, amen, the son of James, and the infamous Judas. Of the scary, the one who betrayed him. The Bible says he administered the Lord's Supper to his disciples. Judas received the Lord's Supper, meaning Judas was forgiven, but did not accept it. He was forgiven, but did not accept it. And somebody today is struggling with forgiveness because you think you got to do something to be forgiven because the devil is trying to make you feel guilty when Jesus made you guiltless. <laughs> forgiveness is not calibrated or based on anything you do but everything he did. Are you listening to me? It's nothing you could do to get God to forgive you. He already forgave you. Are you listening to me? He already forgave you. Amen? Can I go a little bit farther? First Corinthians 15 and 22, Elder John says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ are all made alive. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ have all been made alive. Forgiveness is available for everybody. But you got to accept it. Amen? Amen? It's available for everybody, but you have to accept it. So even if you sin yesterday or this morning, you are forgiven, but you have to accept it. Amen? Amen. We are forgiven. Somebody say, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. But, 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 but you're not forgiven because you've been baptized. You're not forgiven because you partake of the Lord's table. 
Amen. But we're forgiven because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're forgiven because of the life that was given on the cross. He gave his life for our life. He shed his blood for our blood. He died and went down in the grave that we should have went down in. And never to come up out of that dirt. Amen. He did all of that for us. So today we can think about the Lord's table and remember I am forgiven. Amen. I'm forgiven for my past sins. I'm forgiven for my present sins. And I'm forgiven for my future sins. Are you listening to me? The Lord fixed this thing. Let me say it again. The Lord fixed this thing. Amen? That even if you are uh, Sister Righteous or Brother Bible, go to Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned. That's just for Sister Righteous or Brother Bible. I'm above that. That, 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 that can't be me. All have sinned. But Jesus wants us to know we have been forgiven. And whoever's struggling today with the guilt of what you did, listen to me. You're struggling with the guilt of what you did. God told me to tell you, you're saved by what he did. You're saved by what he did. The devil wants to hold you because nobody likes shame. Are you listening to me? He wants to hold you there because nobody likes shame. But I learned something years ago, first lady. Shame's on him. Salvation's on me. Come on, repeat that after me. Say, shame's on him. Salvation's on me. We have to live not a life of struggling with am I good enough to come to church? Am I good enough to participate? Am I good enough? Do I belong? Am I okay to understanding all of us, all of us have sinned? Amen? Amen? And everybody today is living with something. That's why we ask Christ to come into our heart. Amen? Because if we could make it without God, then they would have been able to make it with the law. But works won't work. Works won't work. Amen? It won't work. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, of the Lord's table, this month, I've been doing this on the first Sunday for 33 years, but this first Sunday, the mindset that I'm asking you to have is I am forgiven. Because some of us struggle with the monumental task, Pastor Sherwood, of forgiving ourselves. The first marriage didn't work, and you're still blaming yourself. I could name other things, but I don't want anybody to be sensitive toward it. But just think how we blame ourselves. Today, lock in your spirit. I am forgiven. Because for many of us, the greatest task that we have is forgiving ourselves. If we can ever get over it, understanding that I can't go to church enough, I can't speak in tongues enough, I can't praise enough, I can't give enough for forgiveness. I just have to receive. I just have to accept. And move on. Amen.
my time is up. I thank you for yours. I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Let's stand. Thank you. Just a few minutes over today, but thank you for indulging me. When I was preparing, the Lord was allowing me to go back in my past and see some of my struggles. And then it, a light came on and said, if in your past you struggle, somebody today is struggling. Because we've all said. And sometimes the enemy surrounds us, crowds our mind with guilt, and makes us question ourselves. Am I good enough? Some of us receive, Pastor Sherwood, forgiveness, but not acceptance. So we kind of go in a box, thinking I'm disqualified. But that's not the God we serve. Amen? That's not the God we serve. God washes away our sin. The blood of Jesus washes them away. So fret not thyself because of evildoers. Don't worry about anybody that's trying to make you feel like you're not a Christian. You're a Christian because you accept Christ's forgiveness. And when we partake this month of the table, let our central reminder be, I am forgiven. Amen? I am forgiven. He gave the bread and the cup to all. But Judas still went and did his thing because he did not accept the forgiveness. On Wednesday, he sold him for 30 pieces of silver and gold. On Thursday, he was invited to the table and forgiven. And Friday, he betrayed him. God always knew what his moves were going to be. And he knows what our moves are going to be. One of the greatest scriptures in the word in Isaiah is he knows the end from the beginning. That is powerful. Amen? That the end could be where Minister Sherwood is. And the beginning could be where Elder John is. Come here, Barnett, stand next to Elder John. Next to him on this side. And so what God says is, stand still, John. What God says is, Barnett is God. God says, I take your life, John, and walk to Sherwood. Slow, slow, slow down. Sure, hurry. He says, I take your life, slow down, and I'll go all the way to all the days I ordained for you to be on earth. I go all the way from your beginning to your end. And when I get to your end, Then I turn around and back up. He comes back faster. He backs up and says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. I ordained you. Listen, I knew, let me come down. I know we off, but this is for us. He says, I knew you. And on the way to your end, I knew all your falls. I knew all the times you were going to step out of bounds. I knew all the times you were going to betray me. I still chose you and got you to the end. Now I'm going to back you up and say live. 
with all the mistakes, live. With all the faults, live. With all the, in everything that's going on, live. And when it's all over, you're gonna get where I want you to be and be who I want you to be because I'm God and there's nobody like me. And what I ordained for you, the devil can't stop me. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil can't stop me. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, the devil can't stop me. Now, if you real sure, Karabashanda, if you real sure of what you just said, tell the devil, devil, you can't stop me. I might mess up. I might fall down, I might lie, I might steal, but you can't stop me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout, can't be stopped. Give somebody a high five, say, can't be stopped. Ooh, I see it. Can't be stopped. The devil works on you all night long. He works on you in your dreams. Works on you in your sleep. Works on you in your job. Works on you at your business. Works on you at school. Devil always working on you. But I got something for you to tell the devil. Can't be stopped. I think the Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. You know what God is saying, Therese? God is saying, your life is like this building. When the architect drew this building up, he made a way for you to get in, and he made a way for you to get out. When Jesus ordained your life, the devil made a way for you to get in, but God already had a way for you to get out. Somebody shout, I'm coming out of this. I said, shout, I'm coming out of this. The devil don't want me to come out. But Pastor Sherwood, I'm coming out. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We love you. Can we have two more minutes? Our youth pastor is making some sense. I only heard parts and pieces of it. So I'm going to ask him to come forth and explain to us uh, this basket, raffle, whatever, whatever it is. Did he leave? Oh, <laughs> I was looking for you. I'm allowing him to come and explain to us what that is because we do love our youth. Amen. It's the church of today. Amen. And we love our youth. And look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, when the baby's crying, 